Keeping up with security issues across thousands of web assets without the right approach to web application security is a daunting task. Get ahead with web vulnerability scanning automation from NetSparker, a leader in dynamic and interactive application security testing known for its ease of use and accurate results. Detect a wide range of vulnerabilities in all legacy and modern web applications, address security bugs at scale by automating the confirmation process, automatically prioritize vulnerabilities, and assign actionable tickets to the right developers in their native workflows for rapid remediation. For more information on how to scale application security with ease, visit securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. Qualys has brought together vulnerability management and patch management, letting security teams discover vulnerabilities and apply patches immediately, all within a single unified app. Sign up for a free trial of Qualys VMDR, vulnerability management, detection, and response today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. In our next technical training webcast on May 13th, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, see how attackers gain access to endpoints and learn how to use defensive strategies to protect against those attacks. Also, on May 27th, we'll have a webcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, exploring the latest attacks against DNS and the latest techniques that make it possible to discover and disrupt attacks. Uh, that one will be with Adrian and myself. But make sure you visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register today. Also, securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. You can access our entire archive. We did one today <coughs> on Nginx uh, security and insecurity with Detectify. And that was awesome. I mean, in, in the weeds inside of Nginx configuration, complete with demos on, on how to identify and exploit uh, stuff in Nginx config that I did not know about. Um, and it was just, I mean, you miss a, one slash in your Nginx config and that can open up uh, attacks. So make sure you check that out. That's on our on-demand channel. Now, on to the security news. Lots of news to talk about this week. Where do you guys want to start? Oh, Larry, you had some really had interesting s- ones. You I had it, some crazy like, ones. Uh, pretty Almost all different uh than mine yeah which i which I, I love that we found well you and duck had one in common is the the qualcomm bug yep yeah and, and i hadn't had it that one was a, a pretty new one um ju- and it like just popped up this morning type mm. of thing late last night this morning so i haven't had a chance to dig into it um but uh it, it's still a lot of devices um in that there is um some issues with some Qualcomm chipsets that are used to uh, control the cellular modem. And yeah, you say cellular modem and you know, you think modem back in the day with Hayes AT command set stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's like the same stuff, right? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you know, we talked about many years ago Bluetooth vulnerabilities where the serial port was enabled over Bluetooth. Yeah. You could connect to it and then you could issue AT commands and make the cell phone dial numbers without the user yes. intervention. Yes. Yep. Yep. So um, similar types of things. Um, excuse me. Um, however, uh, in this case, with some uh, specific radio packets or TLV packets that could allegedly be buried into other portions of application, um, uh, processing the uh, type length value packets um, can uh, lead to memory corruption, uh, aka a buffer overflow that can allow them to run their own code in the radio modem which can then be used as a pivot to other portions of the device. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it is uh, typically, um, I, I want to say that it says, um, and they say that the TLV packet can be hidden inside radio cellular communications um, or over the air or multimedia content that when unpacked can reach reach the vulnerable QMI interface. Um so you have to get data on <clears throat> yeah. the cellular network to exploit? So, And that's where I'm kind of confused mm. about this. Like, do we have to inject our own cellular packets into the air? I haven't looked into that in some yeah. time. And, and, well, it's illegal here in the U.S. It's, yeah. it's illegal to research hacking cellular networks, and it's illegal to, to hack cellular networks here in the U.S., um, you know, based on the, um, uh, the the legislation that I saw coming out of the, the Clinton administration at right. the end. I don't know if that has changed, um, <clears throat> but uh, I think that um, those rules are pretty lax now. Mm-hmm. But the big one is if you're going to start hacking cellular stuff, you're doing so in regulated frequencies that 
as yeah. a, you, you don't have permission to transmit in, right. regardless of the type of license you have, unless you are the licensee of those particular frequency ranges, and those are sold to the highest bidder by the FCC mm -hmm. to the cellular providers. Could you so, could you do that like in a in a Faraday space so that it, I mean you could it would be your own setup so it wouldn't actually be in public airwaves. I, mean, uh, I, don't, so I don't think that the anything. the the answer is technically no because you're not allowed to. But that Faraday cage does limit that environment, so that is typically the way folks get around that. Um, the other one too is that it also depends. You know, these types of issues with you transmitting on these frequencies are. Um, here in the U.S., they're uh, monitored or they're they're dealt with by the FCC, uh, and the FCC is a complaint-driven system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they are not listening to see if oh my God, there's right. RF signals in that frequency range that it's illegal for them to use coming out of Larry's house. No, if all of a sudden my neighbor's cell phone starts going wonky or their TV starts you know getting porn on it when it shouldn't be getting porn. And they report it multiple Larry times. Again. Yeah, they report it multiple <laughs> times, then they will come investigate. So, you know, arguably you see many of these devices like software defined radio that you're standing up your own cellular networks. I would be led to believe that many of these folks that are standing up their own cellular networks are doing so with these software defined radios that are very low power devices. And if you put that at something like my house in the middle of the woods, mm. like the only person you're going to bother because of the effective distance of that radio is me or my family. And well, yeah, and if you put it in a skiff or one of those kind of enclosures, you could probably work on it and it wouldn't bother anyone. Right, no and it would also it. never come out. So Right, so you're not going <laughs> right. to leak any signals. So, I mean, I know that there's people like my dad who would say, you know, it doesn't matter if you get caught or not, it's still illegal. But, right. I mean. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, and there, there's so much of our industry that is, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's only illegal if you get caught. Like, and, and absolutely, this is one of those cases. I don't recommend that anybody go and violate the law, but... People are technically violating the law to do these types of things with low power transmission. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Doug, you wouldn't be able to do it in the skiff because transmissions are very highly regulated in a skiff. You'd be breaking two sets of rules. Really? Hmm. Even if oh, it belonged to you? Yeah, I, mean, the, if, I think Doug's talking about building his own. So there are skiff. rules with the skiff. Yeah, but I mean, if it was your skiff, if I owned it and it was in my house. If it's a certified skiff, it's got transmission requirements to be a skiff. Okay. Ooh. So well, a shipping, uh, so a shipping container. <laughs> yeah. A metal shipping container with a metal floor, not that. Yeah. Not that so just paint way, the yeah. paint the walls with copper paint and and give it in a shipping container. Yeah. That's there you go. Sense. That'll work. Yeah, so it's effectively a Faraday cage. Back to back right. to your your comments, Doug. So, uh, you know, admittedly, I've done some testing that is not cellular related. Um, but uh, GPS related, and it's also illegal to transmit on those GPS frequencies, and those are absolutely the ways that uh, you know I've conducted some of that research within a Faraday cage. So, um, yeah. Also, nice. that that said, the uh, the radios that we're using for that type of stuff are very very low power. Um, you know, as an example for low power, uh, one of the testing that I've been doing for the uh, the SANS IoT class that I'm working on um, is a remote power switch, one of those cheap Chinese power switches where you turn, you have the little remote that turns that one on and off. Mm -hmm. um, and I could capture the signal, no problem, but when I tried to replay it, it just wouldn't turn anything off or on mm. because I had to specifically trigger to turn the amplifier on on my HackRF. Yeah, because <laughs> it was so low power output, it wouldn't travel oh. the six feet across to the outlet. Th so. This may be an ignorant question, so but since I happen to have somebody who's an expert here, uh, could you do, could you run those same protocols over like unregulated frequencies? I mean, yeah. just get out completely out of the spectrum, and then you're not breaking any rules, right? It's yep. the same protocol. It's just absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So you'd be yeah. you'd frequency shifting. So a great example yeah. of that, Doug, um, is uh, Poxag pager transmitter stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, you can capture uh, Poxag pager transmitters. You can transmit in the frequencies that are licensed for those Poxag pager transmitters. Um, but I wanted to do so legally. I'm using those same protocols um, over two meter uh, ham radio bands with my software defined radio. Mm. Uh, I am transmitting legally in an area as a ham radio operator, which I am legally allowed to do so because I'm identifying my transmissions with my call sign. And I have some very spe specifically crafted uh, pagers that I ordered from China. Uh, they were about $55 a piece because I had them crystalled specifically to listen in 
on a frequency in the two meter. Oh, and I was going to say you'd have to change the hardware. <clears throat> I yes, to be able to, to transmit and or, or receive. <coughs> yep. In this case, as a pager, receive on that frequency on, on, on frequencies that I was allowed to transmit on. Absolutely, and oh, certainly, yeah, you could re-implement any of these protocols over, um, you know, uh, one of the ISM bands. Uh, you know, uh, four thirty three nine hundred. Um, sorry, 368, 433, 900, 2.45 gigahertz. Did you order those from AliExpress? Um, do you order from there? I do. Um, I placed my first order from there. <coughs> it felt kind of weird. Oh, it's it's kind of weird. Did AliExpress, <laughs> Deal Extreme, uh, Deal Extreme yeah. less so anymore, but AliExpress, based on the stuff that I've been buying, I've been yeah. uh, a lot of stuff from AliExpress. Ironically enough, my parts for my dirt bike, I had to order from Ali. My fork protectors, like plastic fork protectors, I. I Dude, here in the U.S., they were like fifty-five dollars <throat> for a pair, and you know where and they're, they're just pieces of plastic. And you know where they're made? And they're made in China. They're made in China, yeah. and that's this coming from the same factory that, after their shift is over, the plant is shut down, and they run a couple thousand units for the. And they the sell them for market. sixteen dollars a pair on AliExpress. I'm like, these are just pieces of plastic. Like, I just don't want dirt in my forks. Like, really? <laughs> yep. Because you know, I cracked one. Like, yeah, yeah it absolutely. happens. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, even still with the AliExpress stuff, you know, we're getting way off topic, but uh, you will find uh, uh, knockoff electronics, mm -hmm. uh, specifically open source ones. Um, they work. Um, some of the time. <laughs> you order a couple. They're so <coughs> cheap, you order a few. Yeah. Well, I mean, even at these, I mean, we're still talking $150, $200, which mm -hmm. is still cheaper. It was like half price than the the original um, mm -hmm. uh, open source project ones. Um, these are definitely some of the ones that, ordering two <laughs> doesn't necessarily work out for you i have very much done that i'm like oh i'm gonna order this cheap 12 dollar android tablet from china mm -hmm. but what are the chances the first one is gonna suck and it's gonna be broken and arrive so i order five of them for 60 dollars. right and you know what happens a couple are broken no all of them work oh, there you go <laughs> so, I'm like, now what the hell do i do with these five tablets i really only wanted one mm -hmm. so yeah that i yeah that's my that's my problem so yeah, you know, yeah, short answer to a long response, Doug. Yes, you can absolutely quote frequency shift to some of the stuff. You just need to have the appropriate equipment that can both send and receive it. Uh, it's it's protocol over a different frequency range, and, and absolutely. But yeah, I, I mean, if you're not testing the signal, then it doesn't really matter. It, I mean, you could almost yeah. send it over a wire, even if yep. if you're just trying to figure out how the packets work together. It wouldn't matter as long as there's some medium from one side to the other. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. SBR uh, for the win. Yep, the, the challenge becomes with some of these devices that you're looking to do, like my example, um, I actually went and found a distributor in China that could uh, custom crystal uh, these radios so that they would receive in specific frequency ranges, and I paid for it. Um, you know, normally these things are like 12 bucks, uh, but they were able to, you know, put custom crystals in for a, a significant expense, as it were, compared. <laughs> um, you know, they were $55 by the time we were done, and as opposed to 12 Um but if you wanted to test cellular stuff, you know, I haven't done a lot of digging into it, but where do you get a commodity cell phone that you can change the frequency ranges on to be able to like, hey, I want this to be able to do 2.4 gigahertz on my cellular so I can interact with it. I, I, think you, I think you'd have to get like a hardware emulator or something <clears throat> that, was just, that was just emulating the cell phone, you know, like a development tool. So, yeah, I, I don't yeah. think you can do that. My understanding is, and the the interesting one is, is that you start talking about stuff like uh, Open LTE, Open BTS, and some of those. Um, that there were folks that were standing these up in uh, ISM bands, and they had phones that would work on them that they could effectively change them. And I haven't done any looking into that in some time. So mm. there are devices that you can change the reception frequencies, uh, reception and transmit frequencies well, on. But theoretically, are between. It, should be, it should be possible <coughs> theoretically because it, I mean, it works just like any other radio. So mm -hmm. obviously, somehow you can set the frequency. It might be very expensive and difficult, but yep. you should be able to do it. Yep. Some of them are, you know, it was software based. Um, yeah. And in the case of mine, it was you actually had to physically change the hardware to, to do so. I had a, a hardware thing in there about a Raspberry Pi Zero password thief. Oh. So pull credentials from a locked computer. It basically, it runs Responder. Um, hmm. So they're obviously, they says they're commercial products, USB, Armory, and of course the Land Turtle uh, are two examples that do this. Um, they say they cost a, uh, a bit more than a Pi Zero in a USB board. Uh, these were out of stock on, you can buy the whole kit as one on Amazon, but they're out of stock. Um, but I think for something that, you know, might be a throwaway kind of thing, perhaps. Yeah, well, a, a, pretty I cool mean, project. a Pi Zero is about 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
If you get it with Wi-Fi, yeah. It's, yep. Uh, oh, well, the even better, the uh, the Pi Pico is, what, $3? Oh. But oh th they're very similar to, like, you're programming that with the Arduino IDE. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. So, oh, the, My yeah, story the, number the, six. The USB add-on board, yep. yep. Um, I've seen Jim McMurray use some of these. Uh, uh, Lee, some of the projects that you and uh, Lee were working on with him about some of the the yeah, hacking labs and stuff. Yeah, we were actually building, a, trying to build a, 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 a pen test device using a Pi Zero. Yep. Running, uh, now I can't remember the name, but it was basically a basically Cali for a Raspberry Pi. Um, the only problem we learned is you're running the, the attack and the targets on the same Raspberry Pi. That was a little bit more that it can handle. Mm. <laughs> yeah. On the Pi Zero, about Pi Zero W or Pi Zero, yeah, I can see that. Um, but it was but cool. Yes. Yep. It was so I've got a couple around here. I was actually thinking about, um, you know, Paul, you and I both had several stories featuring Python. Yes. The one that caught my attention this week is that there was a, my number's 10 story, for one of the exchange exploits that the NSA released, there is a Python-based proof of concept that exploits it. Now, I realize that in order to exploit it, you have to have a non-patched server with an authenticated session, but... Hey, putting out a POC in Python is pretty freaking cool, no matter how you look at it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a... Uh, you'd be surprised how how deep you can get with with Python, and especially creating network. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's... You've ever done that stuff in C, when I look at the Python exploits that are putting packets on the wire, I'm like, that looks like really familiar. Like, it looks like the way you do it in C. Mm -hmm. And it kind of ties into my story also how um, how Python, are there are disadvantages to using Python lists. Uh, one that you can mix types uh, and the other is mm -hmm. performance. And they advocated for using, uh, Python has a built-in module called array that you can use arrays just like you would in C or C++ and makes the case that um, because it's the arrays in Python are type specific uh, and they are, are a lot more performant. I thought that was interesting. Ooh. Speaking of uh, hardware and Python, uh, Paul, you should totally check out uh, Circuit Python mm -hmm. or uh, MicroPython. Um, mm -hmm. In that, uh, so Adafruit has some stuff. Um, I've got an extra one. Maybe I should bring it to you. Mm -hmm. You know, a little lighty up things. I uh, mm -hmm. think maybe something to play with the kids with. Yeah. Uh, you plug it in, and it shows up as a USB drive. And you take uh, a Python app or a Python code mm -hmm. dot py, and you drag it over to the USB thumb drive, and you unplug it, and it runs that Python code. Oh, wow, that's uh -huh. cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's like make lighty uh, flashes. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hardware Python interpreter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Neat stuff. Um, Where's and, Joff when you need him? I, I know, know, right? And Here then, we are having uh, this Python discussion without Joff. Like, so the, um, uh, the Raspberry Pi Pico, it's, you know, you think uh, Raspberry Pi versus Arduino, mm -hmm. uh, microcontroller versus full functioning system. The Raspberry Pi Pico runs CircuitPython or MicroPython. Mm -hmm. A three dollar thing that you can plug in and it runs your Python. It's awesome. It's cool stuff. Python also had a vulnerability in a standard library called IP address, very similar to the NetMask uh, <laughs> vulnerabilities Oops. as well, uh, which I believe has been fixed. It, it's a very similar kind of thing, like zero zero uh, padding uh, in the IP address. Nice. Um, Doug, what's this thing spread by Discord? Panda? What the yeah, hell? Yeah, it's called, it's called Panda, and uh, it was, I mean, it, it's nothing really, I guess I, I was just mentioning it because so many people use Discord. Uh, like us? It's, it's, yeah, I mean, and, and, and it's one of those things that most people aren't going to get hit with because it's something you have to actually run, so, but it, it was like people were jumping on all these uh, chats, I guess, and and spreading this stuff. Basically, there was an attachment that was being shared via some kind of, a, of an Excel spreadsheet uh, in there, and they were pushing it out. And they called know, it I mean, a booby a booby trapped Excel file. Yeah, it's a <laughs> booby trapped Excel file. And um, <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it, in terms of it being something really dramatic, it it wasn't like a dramatic hack, but it was just something people ought to be aware of because this is this is old school stuff from bulletin board systems, but it works just well right now, and it's available. So 
I guess you could go get it. It's called Collector Stealer. You can grab it, and once you grab it, you can customize it and then turn it loose so that people will, will run on that. And um, it grabs data off your system and sends it up to command server. So, I mean, I, you know, it's really just another standard framework kind of uh, attack, but I, I was interested that people were spreading it across Discord. Did people spread a lot of malware on bulletin board systems, Doug? <laughs> no. I thought I thought that was an old dig at Doug, but like it was. Dude, dude, come on now. <laughs> it was. Come on now. We're of the same oldness at that point. Star Trek.exe. Come on. I was never big into the BBS things. Oh. Uh, yeah. What? Well, I wasn't. What? Really? I missed I missed that boat. I know. Get out. I had wow. an Apple IIe. No, no, get out. My parents wouldn't no, let me really My parents wouldn't let me get a modem. What the hell, dude? <laughs> we watched war games and my parents were like, "No, you're not getting a modem." <laughs> <laughs> Get out. You will cause global thermonuclear <laughs> war. You're not getting impressed. Well, all right. So maybe they they saved you from yourself for a little while. Right. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. For a little while. <laughs> for a little while. And then you built a, built a server farm in your mom's dining room. And then, yeah, well, then, you know, <laughs> then I did get a, a dial-up modem. And we were actually in Rhode Island. We were the first uh, communities to get broadband in the, like, late 90s. It was wow. late '90s. Like I had broadband. Bastard. Yeah, that's like hand crank broadband. It right? was. It was. It was awesome. Somebody had, to, somebody had to get on the bicycle and pedal while you were doing the broadband right? to keep the packets moving. I had my own servers that they would get hacked. That's when I would spread malware mm. amongst yeah. <laughs> all of us. Ooh, look, a Star Trek game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what you played Trade Wars 2002 as well? Yeah, there you go. Oh, see? Oh, yeah. Exactly. We're in the Official point of one of uh, one of my books I'm reading about early days hacking uh, Steve Jackson games. Oh yes, you guys remember that story? That yep. was like the it was a game Cyber, company. Cyberpunk GURPS. Yes, Steve Cyberpunk Jackson, GURPS. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That was that was it. Yep. Wow. So that that was sort of you know towards the beginning of the the explosion of the cyberpunk era with mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Steve Gibson. Uh, sorry, William Gibson. <laughs> and William, William Gibson. Gibson. Yeah. William Gibson and uh, uh, Hugh Gibson. Did and you say Hoot Gibson? Yeah, Hoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Hoot. Um, and uh, Shadowrun, uh, the the set of novels and D&D, or D&D style you know, RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Dude, like, this is like the nostalgia I'm episode now. And for, and for every game that was out there, there was <clears> a, <throat> a file on a bulletin board that said how to beat fill-in name of game here. Yep, and it was an yep. EXE. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> All right. Lee said a good one. Ping back. Oh wait! I want. Sorry, before we get to ping back, go I ahead, want to talk about a quick. Because we talk about cryptocurrency stealing, uh, we steal is the name of a commodity cryptocurrency stealer available for sale. Um, it doesn't masquerade its purpose. It says the leading way to make money in 2021. We steal is a Python-based malware that uses regular expressions to search for strings related to wallet addresses that victims have copied to their clipboard. Talk about pretty low tech, <laughs> right? Yeah, pretty low tech. But, you know, I mean, if people put stuff on their clipboard and leave it there, which is seems... And, and, and you know, clipboards aren't designed like, you know, they, they persist. So if you copy something like, or like I guess on my clipboard right now, if I hit paste, I'm going to see what it comes up. Um, yeah, a Windows server key mm -hmm. that's been on there all afternoon. So I haven't copied anything else to my clipboard. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, the, the, ping, the ping back is back. Go ahead, Larry. I mean, you, I think you and I both picked it. Yeah, I, I picked it, but I didn't get a chance to read it. <laughs> I oh, think okay. one of those, I, I got to flag this sooner later. So, yeah, please. Um, I want to hear about Paul's clapback. <laughs> My what? <No. laughs> so, I mean, basically, what what got me on this one is there's a um, there's a there's a jacked up DLL that uses ICMP for talking back to its control system from Windows 64-bit, which is pretty damn common anymore. 32-bit Windows is becoming m much less the case. Sure. And I was just hearkening back to, um, let's say, the late 80s, early 90s. Well, maybe even later than that. Anyway, when, they, when we were doing a lot more, we're starting to do with firewalls, and people were looking at what could they ride on the ICMP protocol because people were allowing ping through their through their firewalls and, and corrupting it. And what's old is new again. Here we are back 
in 2021 and we're we're doing cnc over icmp that probably Could, flows right through flyer walls oh my god is that well, well, like, that, well i think the mistake people were making back in the day is they were allowing all icmp yeah through right. the firewall just all the variants right but there were certain types and codes like echo reply echo response one yep. is type code zero type zero code zero one's type zero <laughs> code eight something i don't remember now there's certain right, types right. and codes that represent echo uh, request, echo reply. Echo, echo request type 8 code 0. Yes, type 8 code 0. I had it backwards. And then there's the one that uh, that, um, uh, that that Trace uses. Um, what is that one? Oh, God. Yeah, there's a, like, if you send yeah. a UDP packet and it sends an ICMP code. Wow, my TCP IP skills are rusty now. I was totally willfully Damn. unprepared <laughs> for this so, for this discussion. Back 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 in the day when we were talking about this stuff, I remember being in a SANS class from taught by Hal Pomerantz, and mm -hmm. I don't remember much about the class except I remember two things. One, his he was he had a watch that was tied to the uh, Central Time Services, so he said, "I my my time is more accurate than yours. If you're late, you're late." <laughs> and two was a guy in the class try looking at ice lo lo loading payroll payloads into ICMP packets, and he think type twenty. He had figured out how to do it. Yeah, ICMP time exceeded is what Trace route uses. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and, uh, and so those are the ones that you should explicitly allow if you want mm -hmm. that functionality. Mm -hmm. Yep. And of course, uh, if you don't uh, do that and you allow all ICMP, then you allow what we're talking about today mm -hmm. is using it as a back channel for communications. Yep. And uh, Lee, you may have uh, taken another class, um, uh, Sec 617, where you learned about exploiting um, Wi-Fi captive portal uh, networks mm -hmm. or open Wi-Fi networks. Uh, yes, using, we did. Using ICMPTX. Yep. Which still fucking works. Because <laughs> they allow all ICMP <laughs> and they don't you, they if, don't filter on their types and yep, codes. If you do, uh, if, sorry, if you allow echo request and reply outbound from that network, um, uh, requires some premeditation. You set up your receiver somewhere that you can ping on the internet, and you can because right, you can you do can it over the the standard types and codes. Because the payload yep. is kind of um, yep. irrelevant, right? It's operating right. system dependent. What the the payload and, and is, it's, and if it's I remember a, correctly, you're right. And it, the the ICMP uh, specification says uh, the data should be of this length and this type. Yes, should should not must. Should, should is not must. Yeah, exactly. So it will be of that length, but um, you can stuff whatever payload you mm -hmm. want, in that, and there, you know, that there becomes your tunnel. You just have to have something to receive it that can strip that data back out and reassemble it for you. And right. Yeah, that's network security is still important. <laughs> yeah, ICMP yeah. is still important. It is. I mean, well, if you want these utilities to work, mm -hmm. it's still important. You could just drop all <laughs> ICMP, but then you're not going to be able to do ping and trace route. So there. Yeah. And there's Network Basics 101. But a, if a bit if, rusty from some if you, of us. If you're, still there, though. if you're practicing defense in depth, you should be able to do pings and ICMP outbound to the internet from only specific locations in your right, network. Right, right. <sighs> Which true. are probably the most valuable ones where this would be great for Xville. <laughs> So. Doug, you've let, you've let us kind of limp along in this discussion. You know this? You, are you still teaching this stuff? You should know this stuff better mm. than we do, I feel like. Uh, we, we absolutely do. I mean, I, I just understanding those kind of packet layouts and and how that stuff works and is i i personally just think it's so critical because so many things and so many flaws i just don't know how you could be a security professional and not study that kind of level of packet design which mm -hmm. is why when we built the program we built it around networking instead of around programming mm -hmm. not because programming is not important but because i felt like networking was the more critical aspect of some of the stuff and and we had to just do some kind of trade off and yeah i mean really you still see fragmentation reassembly attacks today yep absolutely i mean i just don't want people graduating who don't know what a teardrop attack is or who mm -hmm. couldn't I mean, I don't spend time teaching people really old stuff because it's it's not necessarily that exciting. But you know, if you can't understand ping of death when you read about it, I'd you're not much of a ping of death professional. Ping of Maybe death you don't know so exactly how it works, but when you read about it, you ought to be able to understand it. Ping of death was the one would blue screen certain Windows right. operating systems, yep. right? It blue screened everything because yep. it was a malformed ICMP packet that was basically the the data payload field was set to a number bigger than 255. So it, that's it, it all was, it was. It, yeah. That was all it was. And it crashed Cisco. It crashed everything on the earth. It crashed three comm routers, three comm uh, hubs. 
everything we had crashed when that was running and it took packet sniffing to figure out what was going on mm-hmm. and it was crazy mm-hmm. so yeah i absolutely think that this stuff is critical and, and people that are out there listening who have not studied this i i think you should spend some time getting up to speed on tcp udp icmp all these protocols because that is what uh you know 12 year old hackers study they spend a lot of time studying this stuff and that's why these kind of attacks develop because or, you know lo- adult hackers that act like 12 year olds and blue screen people's pcs in the office that were playing games like my friend bob or did. or the really annoying secretary who got the job because never mind but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's wrong <laughs> Oh, that was Pro Bob. Tip, sending it's all a Bob. ping and pass to a co-worker's workstation may not work out well for you. Ask me how I know this. Say that again? Sending a ping of death to a co-worker's workstation may not work out well for you. <laughs> Oof. Especially if it spreads across the whole network and crashes everything in the chain. Well, yeah. yeah. Don't do oh, that. Always hack with network. permission, kids. Don't listen to what Bob used to uh-huh. do. <laughs> yeah, don't don't listen to me. But yeah, I've been. But I really, I, I have a thing about it. I think it's really critical that people learn a lot of this uh-huh. stuff. And I don't insist necessarily that you memorize every last bit and every last packet. But it's like you ought to be able to understand that when you see it and and when somebody's talking about it. Otherwise, you're you're going to be pretty weak. Mm. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I hit all kinds of the stories are all over the map. Uh, well, we're on the uh, somewhat on the topic of cybersecurity jobs. Um, there was an article that uh, new hires are speaking out about cybersecurity job expectations, and uh, they discussed the issues in the report that uh, which skills are needed for which roles, and there are issues with there. So I I, I like this example. Because I think it underscores some of the issues we have today. That many introductory positions want applicants to hold industry certifications. However, some of them require the CISSP, common certification. <laughs> since, uh, since someone's looking for an entry-level position, they're unlikely to have the requisite five years of experience uh-huh. the certification requires. requires I actually yep. forgot that was a requirement yep. of the CISSP. Yep. It is. Yep. Now, there, now we're, there are definitely ways, quote, around that that your sponsor could get you to you know uh, you know they have five years of equivalent experience based on these practices so i see there's some kind of junior there's some kind of junior cissp too that you can get without the work experience correct correct but when the job requirement says not junior scissp well no i know and i mean we've seen those too and i mean it's usually i think it's just something that was written by somebody who didn't really know anything about these certs and they were like we need us we don't require a cert so put cissp on there i'm like really because i've had students bring that stuff to me and i'm like you can't even get this cert this is ridiculous yep 20 years of uh programming in rust or you know (laughs) golang like it didn't exist 20 years ago. Well, right. I can't possibly. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't there a job application that the, the guy who created Go looked at and it was like so many years ago and he only created it like half that time ago? Yeah, mm-hmm. there was a yep. story about that. Like, yeah, like the creator of Go couldn't get a job programming in Go because he hadn't created it yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. So there's there's certainly issues there. And I, I, do, I do really believe that modeling the healthcare field serves as some great examples i don't i don't know if i i told you guys uh this on this show but i'm talking to my wife about she works in healthcare and she just casually mentioned one day she's like yeah she's like when you go into the healthcare field and like whatever you're applying for whether that's a x-ray technician ultrasound technician uh cna you know whatever it is that you have to take a course in medical terminology and I'm like, well, that's interesting because one of the complaints about getting into cybersecurity is no one understands what the heck we're talking about. <laughs> and so you have to do that and you have to do a clinical uh, study. So you have to go to a hospital and shadow someone for yep. um, a couple of days. I'm like, these are all really positive things that we could do in cybersecurity to yeah. kind of you know, drop some of those bars. Uh, John Strand also had, an, along these lines, had an interesting Twitter post you know, about how we need to be more accepting of people getting into the field Mm -hmm. and you know doing research for a a show i'm I'm trying to build is that i I think there's and i'm not saying that we should still operate this way right i think the notion today is that we should be more accepting and i think model healthcare as to how we get people into the field but there's a deep rich history of how hackers were 
learning their skill and craft and sharing it with others and only those who were worthy, right? We talked about mm-hmm. BBSs. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a, a, a shaming of the, the newbies or, or lamers, right, as mm-hmm. we used to call them. And that's, that oh. was so deeply rooted in the early days of hacking, uh, especially mm-hmm. because there was no formal training for hacking nope. in any shape, form. It, it was all self-taught. And if you spent all that time teaching yourself... Um, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna give that away just for free. Give that away to someone who could potentially do harm with it. Mm-hmm. By the way, or I'm gonna have to spend 15 hours explaining what, you know, a buffer overflow is, right. or like how TCP/IP works, so that they could understand how this thing works. Like, right. yeah, that's yeah. there's there I was mean, a barrier to entry. There was also a lot of uh, access to information was not as ubiquitous as it is today. There wasn't the internet back <clears> then, <throat> right? Uh, certainly, and I think you know a lot of those things. Uh, have changed. I think healthcare is certainly the model, and certainly we have much better training for folks uh, today as well. I think I think that the new hire case, they people forget to focus on the person's ability to learn, apply, and stick to getting to the end point that mm. they don't give up. and And there are a lot of ways people develop those skills that may not have anything to do with cyber but can certainly demonstrate that ability. Yeah. Recently, um, in the gym, I've been talking to a young lady who's been a bodybuilder since she's 17, and what she does in terms of sticking to a goal, thick and thin, in and out, oh my God, on a project, she'd be awesome. She would not give up. But how do you put bodybuilding on a resume and translate it to that kind of stick to it? I have no idea. You know, But, but there's also know, a thing, too. I, I think one of the things in our culture is that you know, not everyone needs to be or wants to be um, the world's most el- elite hacker, reverse engineer, pen tester. In healthcare, you know, that's the doctor maybe level position, right? In bodybuilding, Lee, right, there's the professional bodybuilder. I mean, a lot of right. us work out, right? But we're not aspiring to be, <laughs> we do? you know, the top. <laughs> maybe some of us don't even work right? out, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe we get, maybe you go for a walk a day versus, you know, going to the gym and lifting weights, but versus being a professional bodybuilder, <laughs> right? And, yep. I, mean, you know, I, I mean, I'm all into fitness. I'm all into fitness. This whole hot dog in my mouth. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but, you Sorry, know, that, that doesn't case, mean... That the case like, of the young lady I was talking about, she actually went to a competition a couple of weeks ago. She sent us pictures in her division. She came in fifth out of 12 in her particular group, the total of 130 in the entire set. But uh, I was awesome. like, holy yep. shit. Right, but that shouldn't preclude someone from working in the fitness industry no right no. shouldn't preclude someone from working in healthcare and shouldn't preclude someone from working in cybersecurity. No, we no. need all kinds of people at all different positions with different skill sets that are accomplishing goals and filling roles mm-hmm. in cybersecurity. Yeah. and yeah sure some of us are gonna be maybe people who reverse engineer malware right yep. and some of us yeah. are going to be people who are awesome SOC analysts and CISOs and work on the legal side and work on the compliance side. We, we need all those people working in, in cybersecurity. So it's all about having those uh, well-defined roles and allowing people to come in and work in the field. Um, and you know, like I said, in healthcare, some people want to be the CNA, some people want to be the technician, some people are medical coders, some people are brain surgeons, right? And it's all about, I'm not saying you can't, you can be anything you want to be if you put your mind to it, but you know, mm-hmm. there's a, a career path uh, that I think we need to carve out for people in, in cybersecurity. Yep. And, and you know, so Lee, the, you know, you talk about that dedication to a, something that takes a long time. You know, back in the day, uh, a former employer wanted to promote me to a manager position, but I didn't have my college degree. And they said, "You're so close to getting your college degree, you know, and uh, go back and finish it and get it done, and like that will prove that you went back and you had the chutzpah to go back and go do this thing that took a really long time and was hard to do, especially after this long." So I did it. And mm-hmm. I went and back and I got, remember that. I remember I went back and got my degree, and you know, honestly, they were blowing smoke up my ass yeah. <laughs> for that one, but. And and their argument was that finishing a tall college degree you know, was something that you could stick with for four years that maybe you didn't like, but you got the job done and you you were motivated to get the job done. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a really great measure. Reason. Yeah, I don't think it's a great reason to do it. Right? Yeah, I, I, I no. Well, I mean, I think the the measure is great, but mm-hmm. I don't think that's the right measurement tool. Yeah, agreed. Like, yeah, no, hey, no. you you really stuck with it and are now three hundred thousand dollars in debt. Mm-hmm. That's not, you know, to me, that's no, not no. a great measurement tool. 
But the measurement it shows is that you could accomplish a hard goal. Yep. And that's 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 very good. Yeah. Also gives some indication of your how well rounded you are. But at yep. the same time, that can't be the only measure. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, I think I think the big one, it, you know, just goes to prove that you could actually stop doing the wake and bake and go do something and be productive. <laughs> and that's like, crazy talk. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, oh. I, I, I think, you know, everyone's path's going to be different. And I think that Doug's laughing here because he teaches in a degree <laughs> program. I'm being, for, I'm just being quiet. I'm just, he's there, he's there. I, got my, I got my bottle of wine and I'm just like, okay. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, Doug, uh, all right, we won't say Doug. Someone like Doug has have conversations about how you can hack your way uh, into getting the right degrees without incurring a lot of debt to gain the right knowledge yeah. and experience to have a career in cybersecurity or in technology, right? Yeah. It doesn't always... Yeah. yeah. I, I think that the, the four-year degree is, is pushed too much uh, across the board, mm -hmm. and I think there's lots of different mm -hmm. ways uh, to do it. You know, I, here in Rhode Island, as an example, you can go to a community college. Is that free for... Is it free for anyone that wants to do it? Like, what are the uh, requirements You have to, you have to be there? a resident. You have to be a resident. What are the other right. requirements, Doug? Do you know? There are some grade requirements and things, I think, around yep. that. But, I mean, generally, if you're a resident of the state, and a lot of states have this now. Yeah, mm -hmm. a community uh, college. Generally, if you're a yep. resident of the state, you can go to community college for two years, get an associate's degree. Um, you know, I mean, and like Paul said, this is now about hacking your education, which I would strongly encourage you to do. And I don't mean doing anything illegal. But you can certainly apply the same principles to getting degrees and things because mm -hmm. it's a game, just like anything else. And going to right. community college for two years for free makes an awful lot of sense to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, you, you, then you can transfer. So find the right program. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not to toot my horn, but you know our program accepts people from CCRI. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's that the Community College of Rhode Island, and they're very strong in technology. Yep. Oh, they have a great net yes. tech program. And so, you know, we take people that have been in their net tech program, and we, we love those people. And those guys saved a whole pile of money, right? Because yep. they, did, they it, didn't start paying from day one. And, it, and they, they, but it also proved that they like it, too, right? Because you're not paying yeah. a whole boatload of money to go to a program and find out you don't like it. Right. You're going for free. <clears> and if you find out you like it, hey, guess what? Great. If you find out you don't like it, you didn't spend a whole lot of money. Mm. Because I mean, yep. let's face it—you you, gotta do you, this I, stuff to see if you like. People it. have this bad view of community college, yeah. and they have tons of cool stuff over there. I mean, every time I ever went over there, I was like, "Wow!" They had a welding program. Yeah. They had like this—they had this whole like virtual house that you could wire and learn to be an electrician or a plumber. And I mean, others are great skills to mm -hmm. learn, even if you're not planning to get a degree. It's like, wouldn't it be handy to be able to wire a house? That would mm -hmm. be kind of cool. Yep. Yeah. Like and yeah, and you think about that. Like go to the community college two years for free and get all of your a good portion of your general education requirements out of the way. Yeah. Like like the I, the, the, the and I'm saying the fluff courses the the Cody fingers, but you know some of those like technical writing and the you know those types of things say, are yeah I think fluff. yeah. But R like, writing, writing is certainly something that like, you're going to need you're, for you're, a lot of these fields. You're right? going to need an art elective. You're going mm -hmm. to need a you know a, cr a creative writing elective. You're going to need some math. You're going to need some. But business. just just hack just yep. hack the thing. Look at the school you want to go to and see what they require and find somebody that's got to deal with them so you can transfer after two years and you can get your four year degree and and then mm -hmm. you know you can you because you need it. I mean I'm not going to lie to you in in the modern right or wrong in the modern age you need a college degree. You're going to suffer yeah. if you don't have one um maybe not right up front but you are going to in the long run somebody's going to say wow you, you don't have a college degree and and then you're going to be limited by it because mm -hmm. i know many people that have had that this larry was just describing his experience yep. with it but even a great <clears throat> yeah. way too, doug is get your associate's degree and then go find a job in that field even better and find even, an employer that's going to help you pay no, for no, the no. rest of it no even better yeah. even better go find an employer that is in another state that has a free community college program mm -hmm. that your community college associates will transfer to so that you can take another two years and get your bachelor's degree. <laughs> can you do that? Well, you add that it that oh, doesn't work that way. Well, it, close. I mean, it, there's going to be some that isn't going to overlap. Well, most community colleges can't award four-year degrees, so the bachelor's degree requires the upper two Do years. Interesting. In. Really? Okay, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize oh. that. There's yeah, another there's another use case. And this was a <laughs> case for me. I went in, when I went into Kunkini College, I was not ready to go to college in terms of mentally or prepared. So I spent 4 years in community college and about somewhere around in year 
two and a half. I figured out I wanted to go on to a four year. I was ready. So then I went through and got the rest of the electives and basics that I needed to come in as a junior. I missed one, but I was pretty good. But I'm sure glad I did that on a very low cost instead of paying for a four year to to, to mess around for a few years where I really wasn't ready to be there. But wait, you you did you did you were going to do four years of community college and get a four year degree? No, no, no. I was going to do. No. I was going to community college for two years to get an AA degree, and it got took it. me more because I wasn't ready to be in college. <laughs> uh huh. I yep, wasn't. Got I it. was not mature enough. Got it. I was not ready. You remind me of the, the line from Animal House: Seven years of college <laughs> down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Now, careful. Watch but, it. But <laughs> I'm kidding. But. And when I started, it was actually free, but during the course of my being there, they started charging, I don't know, was it 50 or $75 a quarter? It wasn't expensive. No. Even today, was- community college is very, very inexpensive most places, mm-hmm. so it's definitely worth exploring, even if your free. state doesn't have that for free. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and like, like Lee said, a lot of people aren't ready to go to four-year school uh, sometimes for academic reasons, sometimes just for, you know, maturity. And, you know, it, it's it's a challenge when you go from, you know, living at home and suddenly you're living on a campus surrounded by bars and clubs and, and, and you beautiful know, And beautiful whatever. people. and Yeah, and then, you know, and it may be <clears throat> difficult to focus, and, and a lot of people aren't quite ready for that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so community college can give you an opportunity to pursue that kind of thing as well. Plus, if you screw up and you want to change majors or you don't mm. like the fact that you're majoring in interpretive dance and you really think you should be majoring in art, you can change, and it's so cheap that you didn't really – lose a lot in that whereas you, you you know you sign up to go to some really expensive school and you know two years in you change majors you got another bunch mm-hmm. of years going on, mm-hmm. and that's another problem so i'm a huge <laughs> fan of the community college system i mean just like anything else community colleges vary in quality and and offerings so you know do some research find out what you want to do find out which community colleges best serve what you want to do and and i you know i'll probably get fired because i said all this but I mean, you know, basically, I think it's a really good option for a lot of students to do that. And uh, just do some planning, hack your degree, and you'll you'll do well. And you can save a lot of money at the same time. <clears throat> no, you won't. Ten- <clears throat> tenure. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> you will. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, tell that the, the, one of the community colleges up here, the I think it's CWI. They have an ad in the local movie theaters, and they show you can get a you can learn to fly a helicopter, among other things, while you're there. Mm-hmm. So I've yeah. got some neighborhood yeah. boys going there. They're learning com- uh, computer security and something else. Very cool. Yep. So, so the the, the, uh, the uh, so the, maybe the one that I was thinking about is moving out of state and that type of stuff. Or and you could probably even do it in state because uh, Goose was just commenting on similar types of things. Um, do your first two years at a community college and then transfer to a state school mm-hmm. where you're a resident because you will get you know cheaper prices for being in state yep. resident for state schools. Uh, and some of these state schools are amazing. Yeah. So, absolutely. Yep, and I, I think what uh, you know one of the themes here too is that uh, kind of a closing on this topic, and then I'll move on to more stories. But um, it, for to work in technology and cybersecurity, it, it's not necessarily like you have to have a degree, yeah. right? I mean, to be a doctor and a lawyer, right? Mm-hmm. You can go get your degree, and if that's what you want to do. That's great. Go get your degree, right? What we're looking for in technology and cybersecurity is can you demonstrate the knowledge and skills, yep. right? How you acquire those doesn't so much matter. Whether you learn them on your own, whether you went to a community school or whether you went to an Ivy League school, doesn't really matter. No. Did you acquire those, you know, those skills? And, I mean, that may not apply across the board. Like you're going some hardcore, you know, research kind of, uh, you know, thing. Uh, no. That might be different, but... I think for the most part, what we're looking for in, in competent cybersecurity professionals is, is demonstrate the knowledge. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, changing gears. Hundreds of millions of Dell computers are at risk due to multiple BIOS driver privilege escalation flaws. Uh, technical details aside, and this article is chock full of them. Uh, if, if you want to uh, go read through them, I encourage you to do that. But they could uh, basically allow any user even without privileges, to escalate their privileges and run code in kernel mode. Uh, again, I thought this was kind of different. I thought this was an actual vulnerability in the BIOS, but this is a driver uh, mm-hmm. on the system that allows this to happen so they can use this to gain privileges to run code on unpatched Dell systems using this to gain local privilege escalation. Uh, 
which is interesting. Yeah. Also, the just the uh, attack surface of this vulnerability, the number of computers is staggering. This was documented by uh, Sentinel Labs. Did a great job in the write-up, by the way. Yeah. Again, I mean, in laborious technical detail, uh, stepping through all of the uh, debugging. It looks like an Ida Pro yep. screenshot there. The, yeah, the the the. the Favorite part, I think, about this article is these high severity vulnerabilities, which have been present in Dell devices since 2009, which affect hundreds of million devices and millions of users worldwide, similar to a previous vulnerability I disclosed that hid for 12 years. The impact this could have on users and enterprises that fail to patch is far reaching and significant. 12 years. Unbelievable. Dude, you're getting a Dell. It's a singing computer. I was just, I went to the Dell uh, advisory and just looking at, I mean, the list of affected devices, scroll, inspired, scroll, latitudes, scroll, scroll, scroll. scrolling, more latitudes, optiplexes, precisions, Vostros, that's one I hadn't heard yep, of, yep. XPS, which actually mm. XPS is one of, one of their better laptop platforms. I almost it's bought on the, it's it. It's on the chip so and yeah. it's a chip they don't change very often because of firmware yep. drive mm -hmm. updates so it's a chip that's probably been there for years and years and years and it you know they just keep using it. it's in yeah. the thunderbolt it's, really it's in their thunderbolt docks yeah dell dock I and dell that. thunderbolt docks i tried to put the link to it in my comments for my article 16 the dell advisory because i had the yeah the, the, um sentinel labs posting and it is a, it's a disheartening list it sucks the joy right out of the room <laughs> Uh, right? Yeah, because if, if you deploy Dell in your enterprise, which a lot of people have. But nobody does that. Yeah, <laughs> you've got a lot of updating to do on your systems. And you've got to update uh, what sounds like a pretty low-level driver, which, as we know, when updating things, doesn't always go right. Hmm. And so when that goes wrong, and these are laptops, <laughs> and the person's remote, that could really suck. Mm-hmm. But uh, so, oh boy. so, you know, Paul, if we can uh, move along, yeah, that was yeah. a pretty one. Uh, you, Lee, you talked about sucking the joy right out of the room. Um, you know, speaking, you know, in some cases, uh, either being really a happy event or sucking the joy right out of the room. Tell us about uh, Utah County's online marriage system. So that was kind of a fun story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They came up with a virtual system for getting married at the end of 2019 where they could do the whole thing the license the witnesses the 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 justice of the peace whatever all online and they had it pretty much set to go but really hadn't done anything with it and then COVID hit and we're all you know working stay at home and now they've got like in the last 14 months huge success because you can go to you you can use their system go to utah and get married without having to worry about the fact that you can't be with people mm -hmm. can't the, the offices that they needed to do the paperwork were are often closed or you could you know these guys got it all in there they're in online it's just working i was like it's kind of a non sequitur from our regular cyber stuff but i thought holy crap talk about smart timing i, I wonder if they had a pen test against that application um i don't know <laughs> <laughs> huh. should we phone a friend yeah maybe Maybe is is polygamy a thing? Like multiple wives in in <laughs> yes. Utah? Yes, it it is yes. a thing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's illegal yeah. though. It's not it's not like legally sanctioned by the state, but but the church and it's federally illegal. I, it, right? But, yeah, but, I know. There's all kinds of article like uh, law articles about whether it's actually legal in Utah or not. Hey, they got inmate inmate weddings. You know, that's a tough one. And, uh, are those recognized by the st uh, that very state to state as well? In inmate weddings, yeah. International weddings, it's like inmate international inmate weddings. It says inmate and international weddings. Twenty three thousand military inmate and international weddings. Wow, like where do they? What's the, where do they like draw the whole, line? Where do they draw the line between inmate interstate and military? <laughs> this is a whole <laughs> like, different segment. Could two we could, inmates <laughs> from different states get married on this site? Yeah, or two inmates internationally. But in Utah, that are you, both you, in the military. You have you to be a Turkish resident. You have to be a resident of Utah to have it recognized in Utah as a marriage. Wow. I, I don't know. I, well, I mean, it doesn't sound like it because if they did international weddings. 
I was guessing that was with a U.S. citizen was marrying someone internationally. Mm. Like, so, I mean, my wife and I got married in New York. We weren't New York residents. Right. We just went and well, got no, a marriage license in New York and got married. Like, you never heard of anybody so eloping to Las It might be a good Vegas segue to into <coughs> reality TV star Josh Duggar. <laughs> Is this the, Josh what was the Duggars? What was that? Was that a... <sighs> it was a show about this giant family. They had like I don't know, like twenty five kids, kids or something. Yeah. Was he one of the kids? Is no, that... he was the father. Yeah, he was one of the kids. Wasn't oh, was he? he? He was one of the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm pretty sure. I've well, never seen the show, but I, I remember somebody nineteen was kids watching. and counting was the. Yeah, yeah. It was just about like yeah. It was, <laughs> but but uh, and I say that because he was married. Like, was he one of the kids and he was married and still? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, they got that many kids. Some of them are like 20 years old when other right. ones are okay. just born. Right. Yeah. Good Good point. But there was something about he, his wife had porn and he had porn. What was well, the, no, what was this no. story? So, uh, and you, I didn't really read into it because it was one of those kind of ugh, stories. Um, allegedly, um, his wife installed anti-porn software on his computer. What is anti-porn software? Is that like... Child, I, don't, I, I don't know. My wife uh, hasn't installed it on my computer yet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like fil like filtering. Yeah, a, like, like yeah, some filtering, like, yeah, some filtering stuff. That's like so a media thing. Anti porn software. Yeah. yeah, but but so he used anti anti porn software. What what is that? To get around, it was software to get around the anti porn software. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. So we used the VPN. Sounds like something out of a movie. Yeah. So like I, just, I saw the story. I figured anti porn <laughs> software was just like old net nanny stuff, and I figured yeah, it was like, anti net I nanny. That's what we're talking about. Remember net nanny? Yeah. Well, you know, you could get around net nanny by just putting in the uh, the the numerical uh, IP address instead of the actual IP yeah, address. Right. And it, it couldn't do that math. It was just a DNS blacklist. That's all it was. Well, yep. yeah, that's all NetNanny was. Was yeah, it was literally a DNS blacklist. And if you you either it actually did have IPs in it. So, but then if you went and you converted the IP address to a 32-bit number, mm -hmm. you could get around it because that is part of the protocol. And sounds like you speak uh, from experience, Doug. <laughs> I did a. Uh, we did quite a few cases like that where schools were going like, we yep. don't understand this. We we spent all this money on this this uh, anti pornography software. And the kids are still getting porn. And the kids are downloading more porn than ever. And I'm like, look, and they're learning hacking tactics too. So there was a good side to this. So uh, the but, software that the wife installed was called Covenant, Covenant Eyes. Eyes. Covenant the utility Eyes. advertised being safe, secure, and proven effective at helping members overcome porn addiction. Dude, you should check that out. It I'm popped sure. right up on there. Screen so accountability. She, so it said. helps you to break. It says it helps you break the cycle. Quit porn and live your best life. Live porn free with confidence. Mm. And they show they show frustrated looking guys. Yeah, because they've got Covenant installed. I mean, I'd be frustrated too. Partner what? up to defeat porn, life-changing conversations, and break bad habits for good. It says Duggar installed life. additional software that hit his internet usage from Covenant Eyes. Doesn't say what it was. VPN. <clears throat> oh, I think it it grabs. It says blurred screenshots are sent over HTTPS and stored <clears throat> using AES two fifty six encryption. We never send unblurred screenshots. So, I guess when you, I wish it, I'm trying to find it if it tells how it works. Oh, Screen. but he was he was caught uh, for mm. child porn. Yeah, Ultima no, ultimately, ultimately, yeah. ultimately, his anti anti porn stuff didn't help him um, because he got nailed for child porn, which the investigators said that was one of the top five worst of the worst that he've ever had to examine. Ugh, that's gross. So I I I, I look at the final sentence that <sighs> after you're talking about being out on bail and back home with his six kids and pregnant wife. Who presumably is installing anti 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 porn <laughs> software? <laughs> yeah, it's called throw at the fucking computer. But yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Hey, yep. he'll change, really. Yep. Nope. Yeah. Nope. No, I, I don't think so either. Yeah, I, I, I'll refrain from you know commenting on some of that other child porn stuff until after the show in private company. Yeah, it's yep. gross. We had Chris Hadnagy on the show also. Yep. Uh, yeah. Let's move so on. The theoretically, it blurs out it blurs out the porn, and then it also shares what you're looking at with an ally. Dude, I don't know how that works. Like, Is it? That, that would be that would be like you know watching that 
cable TV porn. Like yeah, where you had to, yes. where you, where you, you like you tuned into channel six and you put the cable box on forty seven and like you got the weird, you know, oh, look, there's a boob. I think that's a boob. Is that a, and is then that even better, I could share it with you. Right, <laughs> right. Oh my God. I'm all set knowing yeah. what you guys look at. I don't want to know what you guys look at on the internet. <laughs> Doug, Doug, start sharing some with him, will you? Yeah, all set. Thanks. Uh, uh, <laughs> New attacks are slaughtering the Spectre defenses. Uh, I thought this article did a good job of uh, yeah. actually. You know, we, uh, one of the other threat post articles. What was in the other threat post article? There was some weird uh, reference that you guys had in the other threat post article that was kind of it was kind of wonky. What did they say? It was about the ping attack. It was something in the other threat post article. It was weird, but in this one. Uh, this author on ThreatPost did a fantastic job, uh, and I, I posted it in in uh, in our story because uh, the way they talk about Spectre, I thought they did a great job of kind of breaking it down. Right, processor predicts instructions; it might have ex executing and prepares uh, by uh, following the predicted path to pull instructions out of memory. If it stumbles on the wrong path, the technique leaves traces that make private de data detectable by hackers. Summarizing Spectre attacks uh, that way is not easy. And did a great yeah. job. The new one uh, is a different way. It's the micro op cache and on chip structure yep. that speeds up computing by storing yeah. simple commands, allowing the processor to fetch them quickly and early in the speculative execution process. As the team explains in their write up from the University of Virginia, even though the processor quickly realizes its mistake and does a U turn to go down the right path, attackers can still get at the data while the processor is heading in the wrong direction. Whoops! Right. I th great job explaining that because that's not easy stuff to explain. And like I read that and understood it, which if you've read articles about Spectre, you got to read them a couple times to kind of digest them. So I thought they did a good job. Oh. So there's a new attack, and this one, I mean, basically what they also said in the article was like this is going to have performance impacts to be able to defend right. against these attacks. Because that was the point I was going to make. I also I also posted that story, but I didn't do the threat post one. I did one from. Um, IT news in actually mm -hmm. Australia and they made that same comment that you know patches to disable the micro app cache or halt speculative execution on legacy hardware would effectively roll back all these critical performance enhancements we've seen and this just isn't feasible um that's one of those risk based decisions on patching right. spec I seem to remember I think it was the the specter patches had the had the big um performance hit and in the HPC community, they pretty much said, uh, we'll pass. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We need the performance. Right. I mean, if you run Chrome and Teams on your computer, you need all the performance you can get, and you're throwing these patches right out the window. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. This, this attack was pretty esoteric, though. I, I mean, it, mm. it, was, it was definitely one of those things where – I don't think anybody's found a way to operationalize this. And I might be wrong, but I, I read a bunch about this the other day because I did a story in the news, and I was reading about it, and it, it's kind of like that, you know, extracting data from a hard drive with a with electron microscope kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's doable, it's feasible, but you can't really control what data you're getting and how much of it you're getting. You're only getting the fragments of things that came out of private stores. So yeah, it could be part of a key. It mm -hmm. could be part of a token. But I, I wonder how how easy it is to get anything significant out of that. I mean, are you just getting like little chunks, which could be a problem or maybe not? So they said it wasn't being run in the wild. And that even the article I read said, you know, they, there was very, it wasn't something easy to do. I didn't have a chance to digest the paper that they put out between the two universities. It's about 14 pages. Um, did you have a chance to look at that, Doug, at all? I did. I, 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 read the, I read the paper, and, I mean, I, I, it, it just sort of reinforced, you know, I mean, it, it's a very cool thing that they found. and But, but I think it's, it's one, it's not low-hanging fruit. It's not something okay. that everybody's going to be able to exploit. And even if you're oh. able to exploit the side channel attack, causing this thing to fail in some kind of productive way mm. is going to be very, very difficult because you would have to essentially force the algorithm to select the data you want by mistake and then leave it hanging there so you could get it. Oh. 
And, you know, that's oh, starting right. to be that many, many paths kind of thing to get to anything productive. Now, can you proof of concept this and actually extract data? Yes. Can you do it in a productive way? That's the other, you know, there's two pieces yeah, of that. Yeah. So there, just like the electron microscope thing, which I thought was the best example of that, you know, as a comparison, what, could you do it? Yes, absolutely. You need an electron microscope, hard drive platter. Could you do it in a way... Uh, Craig Wright was a person who wrote all the papers about this and proved that, yeah, you could do it, but your likelihood you were going to get anything useful was really, really low. It was a little bit lower than flipping a coin. You mean Satoshi? And, yeah, go ahead. like Bitcoin, that, Craig that, Wright? That Craig Wright? Uh, yeah, well, Craig Wright was one of the people that wrote a bunch of papers about that electron microscope. Oh, yeah, thing. he was an yeah. accomplished was a PhD computer scientist, right? Yep. Okay, I was just yeah. making sure it was the same guy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was. I hadn't heard that name in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sorry, Doug. Sorry, Doug. Well, yeah, because I had written a paper about I got in a big fight, like one of those, you know, sort of what today would have been a Twitter slap fight kind of thing with uh, the gra one of the grad students of the professor who had written the original stuff about that because I wrote a paper talking for corporate purposes of wiping drives, you know, just basically wiping them was sufficient for most stuff. And this guy said, well, you know, you've neglected this whole electron microscope thing. And that guy wrote a paper trying to refute what I said. And Craig Wright got involved in it because he said this is stupid. And he bought an electron microscope. And, and he, they actually did a bunch of tests on this to show, yep, yeah, they were able to get data. But flipping a coin was actually just about as effective. So getting mm. a significant pattern of bits that you could actually reconstruct anything that would be useful was almost impossible. So, you know, it, it's all about theory and practice. Theory's great, it's fun, but in practice, I'm not totally sure this Spectre thing is is got legs in terms of somebody being able to manipulate this. Now, somebody may, though. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, and sometimes what happens, too, in my experience in, you know, understanding some of this research is sometimes it's used as a portion of another attack right it's mm -hmm. kind of chained absolutely with other things like the attack is not yep. just this technique but this technique is used with conjunction some other vulnerability and some other vulnerability and and now it can really absolutely and, and yeah. don't get me wrong i don't want anybody out there thinking i said this was not a real threat i'm right. just saying that by it's itself a, a very esoteric piece of a threat yeah. And yeah, it could be put together with other things. There may be some way to write code that can exploit this thing so that you can pull back keys or all kinds of things out of private space. It's just, but that it, at, at this point, it hasn't been fleshed out to that level. Mm -hmm. um, I've yeah, got, I, uh, oh, go I'm ahead. just going to quick my story number 15. And I've got one after that. Um, <clears throat> a hacker began uh, posting patients' deepest secrets online. I don't know which country this. Stemmed you go, you're from, 15? This was a uh, Wired article. Yes, uh, I had the same one. That was uh, from, it, uh, it was Finland. It was Finland. Finland. Yep. Yeah, <clears throat> it was Finland, and like basically, this 22-year-old college student um, that it had some mental health issues in his past, mm -hmm. uh, and not fall, uh, people have mental health issues. He sought help for his mental health issues. Uh, was <clears throat> going to school, working, you know, on the up and up. And, like basically, it's a Snapchat message with. Like all of his personal details, his name, social security number, yep. the name of the clinic where he'd gotten his mental health treatments, which was Vestamo. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't recognize the sender. And basically, uh, they were demanding a ransom and said, you know, if in 24 hours we don't get this ransom, um, then after that, it's going to be more ransom after 48 yep. hours. And then after that, we're going to publish all of your information. Turns out that this person wasn't alone. I thought this article was great in understanding the human element behind mm. ransomware yeah right absolutely uh, so this was i i read this and it, mm. i read this this morning actually and it was an interesting story so uh was it vostromo um became yep. this um uh huge uh telehealth uh presence yes for uh, uh mental uh mental health um in finland uh and um, as they started to grow there were two methods that you could apply for security stamp that you were doing the right thing for security uh like you know pci various pci levels and they've uh applied for level b all the time uh because level a required that you submitted your electronic data to the state run collaborative mm -hmm. but the state run collaborative wouldn't respond to their requests about how the data needed to be formatted and how they were going to isolate mental health data from the patient's regular 
me- medical record, which you know, here in Rhode Island, that's a big deal. Mm. Like those are two distinct records, and never the right. twain shall meet because it, mental health is is a different problem than your physical health. Um, so they never responded. So they said, well, then if you can't respond, if we can't comply with it, we'll always comply with Part B. And they kept getting the rubber stamp for the Part B, which was basically folks that are putting it in manila envelopes and file cabinets. Mm -hmm. Um, Uh. Turns out this whole infrastructure was basically built on like unencrypted MySQL databases. And uh, turns out the two admins that were hired to manage all of their network had a former criminal background that they, well, they were acquitted of doing bad things uh, and uh, they wanted to be able to administer the servers from home so they opened up the firewall rules to the MySQL server and hackers found uh, that the MySQL server had a really weak password bad. which was directly connected to the internet. Also, just like PSA uh, <laughs> announcement and when I read this article, one thing jumped out at me. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Carl Hart uh, and his research. He spent the better part of 20 years studying the effects of drugs on people. Yes. One of the authoritative, uh, I think, people on this, I listened to his Joe Rogan interview and uh, read his book, and it was <coughs> awesome. And this article mentions like using marijuana, LSD, DMT, mm-hmm. also talks about like drinking vodka, his vape pen, and using Xanax at the same time. Like, if, if you listen and read the, the works of Dr. Carl Hart, mixing is bad. Like, mm-hmm. just public service for our community, <laughs> mixing is really, really mm-hmm. bad and can lead certainly mm-hmm. to death. Uh, in in a lot of yep. cases, like don't don't this article doesn't call that out, and I just wanted to call that out uh, it, it, within the context of this article, yep. like really bad. But still, don't, so don't I mean, that. somewhere and then so deepest darkest secrets being quote, yeah. ransomware off, and they targeted the company, and the company refused to pay. Um, they knew about some issues, and then they got bought. Mm-hmm. And didn't disclose the issues. So now the purchasing company is basically saying, "Hey, we paid you eleven point seven million dollars, and you guys totally effed up. You need to give us our eleven point seven million dollars back." And by the way, we still own the company. Yep. So yeah, they're looking to recoup their their investment. Mm. And yeah, it's think that'll uh, happen. I certainly hope so. Um, all yeah, of the um, asset, all of the assets by like the it, former yeah, owner are, of, are frozen. Yeah. So yeah, it's in a, in a lot of agreements when companies yep. are bought and sold. Yep. Yep. And you know, yeah. you know international stuff here, but. So, yeah. well, because I, I was, I, I got all kind of wound up when my story eleven, which was about, um, uh, what was it? it oh, was, QNAP. Uh, was that the one you wanted to go yes. next? Yes, oh, yes, yeah. that was oh, the. Uh, I didn't it, watch it, the video. I it, was just reading your guys' yeah, comments. So on it. Adrian Sanabria posted this to the, our dis, our Slack channel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, about, our Slack, our signal, our yeah, Discord, one of the ways, our teams. Yeah, um, and <laughs> and he was like, uh, what about media? This was a heart-wrenching video that I forced myself to watch. And I'm like, wow. Like, this video about this guy hit on so many things that we've oh, been talking about in the industry for so long. Interesting. I didn't watch the video. So the big deal was um, this particular YouTube guy um, uh, had uh, was... was ranting about the problem that he had with his QNAP NAS. Uh, and his QNAP NAS was full of MP3s and every picture he's ever taken since college, mm-hmm. including the weddings and his wedding and that of his kids and just oodles and oodles of really Im- data that was really important to him. Mm-hmm. And it got ransomware. Mm. <clears throat> and he was on a ramp, basically like, QNAP, you had a responsibility. You knew about this vulnerability. You didn't tell any of us. Like, he's saying, you should have emailed me. Like, how many of us are on those email lists? Ignore. Of like, yeah, exactly. Spam. And you, the bulk sh- you email. should have emailed me to update this device. How many people update their devices? Even when they email and say it's a critical vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Like, and you should have auto-patched. And what if we auto patched in the middle of you doing this massive write operation for something that was amazing and it rebooted? Mm-hmm. And like this device shouldn't have been vulnerable to begin with. Mm, all software has bugs. Crickets. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. This thing should have never been connected to the internet. UPnP was probably on. Like, mm. and your response was awful. Like we did the right thing. Like maybe not. And maybe I, I understand that he's irate at QNAP because he lost all of the stuff. And he went into finding some stuff about, you know, folks had found that um, 
uh, they, you could get your own keys back by not paying and so forth because someone had, had broken it. He said, but at that point, he was already too late. I don't understand why he was already too late about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, the key's um, key, yeah. Yep, and uh, he said uh, that QNAP offered really bad advice. Like, he, they said that uh, if you detect that this ransomware attack is happening because all of a sudden your drives are going to be churning, don't turn it off. Just let it happen. Whoa. Wait, what? Yeah, that that one I don't necessarily agree with. Hmm. Um, oh. The you know so the other one was like, yeah, uh, this was my storage, and I chose not to have a backup. Yeah, like this was my backup. I thought was what he's saying. No, it was his backup. no, it wasn't his backup. That was his storage. Oh and, shit! And he chose the like you read the YouTube description and he says I chose not to have a backup of my NAS. Yeah, <laughs> like. Admittedly, these are enterprise problems. Yeah, for yeah. some. I mean, we got bit by that. We lo we so lost one of our uh, storage. Did you Drobo? Yeah, Drobo. Do you have a backup? Uh, for some of the files, we did not, and it turned out to be not a huge deal. Yeah, and, but but I, mean, I recovered what I what I could. Yeah. Um. But you know, then after that, we did have better <laughs> better backups. <laughs> yep. uh, and, and, and I I think you know as many of us know the work in technology we create backups of of the backups and periodic mm -hmm. snapshots and it yeah. look i mean usb hard drives are really cheap <clears throat> mm -hmm. and so you get one and usb c is really fast and so you you pop it in you make a backup you know before you go to bed you drag over hundreds maybe even a terabyte and mm -hmm. you go to sleep and you wake up the next day and you safely remove that drive mm -hmm. and you take it and you put it in a drawer somewhere and Hell that's yeah. your backup. Yep. I, I mean, we all know that as being nerds and technologists right. and yeah. doing this stuff I, for a I, long and time. I, and I think, th I think the big one that really, like, I, look, I, I, I listened to, and I kind of skipped around through the video a little bit, but I, he ab apologized for the gratuitous use of the bleeping mm. because he swore through the whole thing because he was so pissed that QNAP had a responsibility for keeping him safe and that he chose not to have a backup. But all of these things, enterprise-wise, like these were things that we've solved or we've tried to solve and we've, you know, the problem is is that now these enterprise technologies are coming into the home by folks that don't realize that you need to patch your shit. Right. You need to keep on track of the stuff that they're sending you for vulnerability issues. Like this isn't spam, this is important. You need to understand what the importance of these mm. are, and you need to have your own backup plan for your stuff. But the consumer stuff is you plug it in and you do magic things with it, and it's magic. Mm -hmm. It just works. So, well, like, how do we solve this problem going forward for the people that just think this ma is magic and, you know, not have them rant about all these things that they really should have been doing, even though they're not IT professionals? Backups of the backups. Yeah. That's important. Yeah, and, and, Adrian pointed out that his point in sharing that was not that he was compromised. He was compromised with features he never wanted and didn't enable yep. in apps they preloaded and he never used. It, it, yeah. it, 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 it's the, I don't know, it reminded me of, of what people that aren't really familiar with IT that are, but are, have chosen to use it are running through. They don't, they're, they're not thinking like a cybersecurity professional minimum per uh, privileges take out the stuff you don't need yep. they're thinking turn it on it's a toaster yeah yeah absolutely like i didn't want this multimedia f feature so i had it turned off but the problem was that it wasn't with the multimedia feature that was the problem it was because your web interface or something sharing was turned on by default or became enabled at some point through upnp right. i mean also you and, shouldn't just trust i mean w mm -hmm. again we were into the studio like and it's, it's my fault for not educating having backups of the backups, you know, with the staff here. But uh, and I don't fault anyone for that. But like the NAS failed. And you think if you have a NAS yep. that has redundancy built in. That, that was another. Yeah. yeah that was like another one of his point. Like You've he, got it. But like we had a in, in Tyler Robinson worked with me on it because he had done some NAS mm -hmm, recovery on mm -hmm. this on the Drobo platform in the past. He's like, dude, I've never seen that. I'm like, dude, shit happens. Mm -hmm, yep. Like I'll recover what I can recover and whatever i can i'm like it's it's gone mm -hmm. thankfully it was nothing mission critical yeah. that we couldn't recreate or whatever yeah. right 
and that was sort of one of the other ones too that he said like we buy these devices because it says raid that's the backup right there no <laughs> like until you get crypto lockered you know and then you get yeah. ransomware or until it just so, i mean it yeah. just, uh, doug i mean i think you were working with me on the the nas problem too like but raid doesn't mean it's not there's uh, it's immune to all kinds of failure, don't right? Even, don't even get me started on that lecture. I, I've right? given that lecture so many times that like raid is you know raid is protects you from hardware failure. It's not a backup, right? Right. And you know right. I mean and right. actually it, it, recovery very effective if you have hardware failure. So yeah. a drive blows, raid saves you. But also but, like from a recovery standpoint, it's almost it's harder to recover something that was absolutely. raid. Because the data yes. is striped across all the drives. I had to buy special yes. software to be able to oh, put the yeah. RAID back together to be able to do the restore and get back what I could get back, right? Uh-huh. And RAID makes things more complicated yes. storage-wise. It makes more complicated. And, and it doesn't do one little bit of a thing to save you from any sort of software threat or data corruption. Right. Because RAID will be more than happy to protect your ransomware encrypted data yeah. just the same way it protects right. your unencrypted <laughs> data. Not, not to mention a lot of these uh, file system comp or uh, storage companies have their own versions of RAID. Like like Drobo yeah. has its own version of RAID, so you can mm -hmm. mix and yeah. match different drive sizes. Or there's a patented yeah. technology, I would assume. Every card, you know, yeah. I mean, you you can't even inter usually Ooh. interchange different cards because even the same RAID level from a different card won't work. <coughs> won't the work because they're yep. implementing even standard. It's the RAID same thing. Like yeah. people that think that if they encrypt their data in a partition, it will be protected from ransomware. I'm like, no, it's not. The, the ransomware yeah. will encrypt the encryption, and you still can't get to it. You can't get to your, your encrypted data. But people have, a, there's a lot of misconceptions about mm. uh, data mm. storage. And, 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 and another one, if you, I, if you do your offline backup like you just discussed, Paul, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you know where you put it. Right, Tyler? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, Tyler? Oh. Oops. Sorry. He's Oops. not here. <laughs> so, so the other thing that it just reminded me of, um, the other day I was talking to a friend in the in, in the gym and she was having trouble with skype on her computer and she'd taken it to i think it was staples a few times lee you talk to lots and of friends that are he she makes a lot of, he makes yeah, a lot of friends at the gym i mean man. he's a good looking yeah. guy i get it but well actually i i got to attribute my my wife to making the relationship she she's the oh. one who says hi to everybody and she's then the social bio, she yep. introduces us and then we start talking um but uh what happened is she couldn't get zoom working and she took it to him several times and they finally said you know you need to call Zoom, but she's a free Zoom user, and they don't provide support for that. And my right. point is, there's lots of lots of bad advice out there that consumers mm, yeah. don't know is bad advice. I mean, they'll look it up online, and they can't tell what's crap and what's genuine, mm, or they'll yep. or they'll talk to their their trusted source, and they get bad answers. I'm gonna I'm I mean, gonna throw it's, a bad. It's a hard problem. I'm gonna throw a bad analogy out there. They can't tell what's CNN and what's Fox News. Mm. <laughs> it's all propaganda, uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At this but, point, <laughs> I mean, see, that was a, like I said, it was a bad analogy. Like they, can't but do, I they mean, can't. but to that analogy, no. a lot of what you read about technology could be propaganda as well. Yeah, right? not everything you read on the internet. Uh, you know, what what is it? Uh, uh, Eighty-seven point five percent of all the statistics on the internet are made up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, one of the last stories I want to cover: GitHub exploits and malware policy updates. Oh, this is a huge one. Huge. This is a huge one. Right. And like uh, exploits are posted online. They have been since, mm -hmm. well, we talked about the beginning of the BBS mm -hmm. days. I mean, that was the beginning of people posting, uh, you know, their exploits, right? And it's always been shared. Certain exploits have been shared mm -hmm. with the community in certain forums and certain levels of that, certainly. And, you know, GitHub has become a very popular place, place to post uh, exploit code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And their existing language, and, and here's where I <clears throat> I think it's kind of weird. So their existing language said that active malware and exploits was bad. And they're like, well, that was too broad. So yep. now our intent is to narrow the scope to malware and exploits that are directly supporting unlawful activity. So you can carry a knife, but like don't stab people with it. And, yeah. and, and like, that, how do you know if the knife the person's carrying is you're going to stab someone or you're going to use it to open your Amazon packages? Right, right. <laughs> and, and this is back to uh, Congressman, uh, Congressman Lam Langevin's comments about dual purpose, yes, dual, dual he, use technology. He, yeah. did. He, like, he called this out like, specifically. Like, he nailed yep. it. Like, yep. uh, some other ones, too, is that not only is it related to the code that ho is hosted on GitHub, it's also in how GitHub is used for, like, C2. 
Yes. Like GitHub can be used for C2. Are you using that as part of an act? Are you using our infrastructure as part of an active attack against some nation state for bad purposes? Or are you using it against a customer that you are con un contractually permitted to mm -hmm. do these types of things? And how can they make the distinction? Right. And, I mean, and, my, my and knife where, analogy is bad in that fact. Like, where? What's that? But, unlawful where right yeah you know i mean so if i'm posting something on github they don't actually know where i'm located so whose set of laws are they using yemen or or the state of florida yes mm -hmm. yeah and but like one of the benefits of being able to see the exploit are understand how it's written mm -hmm. how it works defend against it maybe we can defend against it Maybe there's bugs in the exploit that we can use to disable it because we've seen a history mm -hmm. of that in mm -hmm. the past. So it's kind of a bad analogy to the knife thing. Like knife is a pointy, sharp object, right? Very simple. Mm -hmm. When it comes to exploits, there's a lot more here. Yeah. So how do you like, you know, what could be directly supporting on the, I mean, there are things certainly that are clearly supporting unlawful activity. Like we covered the cryptocurrency stealer called we steal mm -hmm. which is obviously promoting itself mm -hmm. as unlawful activity yep. so i mean there are clear cases but a lot of the stuff but the the point being is that now if you post we steal that has some potential legitimate use for understanding for the, me the mechanism yeah. that was used to make that happen where was the vulnerability in discord mm -hmm. and so the mm -hmm. neat thing I think about this particular GitHub problem is that they put their policy on GitHub. Right. And it's open for comment mm -hmm. by the community. And you can do a pull request. Yep. Rewrite really? it. Rewrite it. Yeah. It's open for pull. It's open for comment. So I think the big one that I like, want to get out of the story is that I encourage our listeners and our viewers to go click the link and comment good bad ugly otherwise but go comment make your voice heard um if you want to do a pull request do a pull request like yeah. change propose the language go do it take some action I think regulating stuff on the internet is hard yeah really I, is. <laughs> there's it a great really comment is. regulating the, the internet is hard maybe you shouldn't regulate maybe you, like yeah no <sighs> You have an opportunity. Uh, we, as an uh, as a community, have the opportunity to change the rules and direct the rules. Go do it. Mm. Oh, it's really it, I mean, it's, it's a slippery slope get, too. Get to, clone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get clone. Make your changes. Get add the file name. Get commit. Get push. Right. I I yeah. guess my whole thing yeah, is or like get pull, right? it's going to get posted somewhere on the internet where people can find it yeah i don't care whether it's pastebin exploit db like what there's a, a million ways now to share stuff mm -hmm. on the internet so i mean mm -hmm. github i think is just make convenient it, for people to do that make it, but, make it on nz oh my god i mean we could create a huge list of ways you could share or we could just create our own wait whatever or, yeah or server. you could you know stand up a server in an underground bunker somewhere in another country yeah, let's just do it on AWS. Out, outside of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> jurisdiction. Just do it right? on AWS. Yeah. Yemen. 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 There's like a, yeah, there's oh, a million so, so we're going to stand up in Jamaica, Yemen. Is well, a, yeah, is Jamaica's port probably open through the firewall. Fun. You remember what runs on port 70? No. No. Gopher. Gopher. Oh, a port stumper? Oh, my God. No, I I can't believe I don't know what that is. U U C P. It's it's like <laughs> it's it's as common as hen's teeth there, Doug. It's used to be a thing, but it's been what thirty something years. What? So all right, so Lee, what port did uh, uh, wide area information search run on? Oh God, D is, uh, w, w A I S port stumper. Oh ways, oh God, I used to run away server too. Uh -huh. It was eighty something. Oh, it's uh, uh -huh. it's quote of the day. <laughs> Oh, oh I remember Waze. I gotta look it up, but uh -huh. damn it, I ran away server, which is this is killing me, Doug. <laughs> no, port seventeen is quote of the day. No, so he you... said seventy. Oh, seven, he said seven, seventy. Seven, I thought he said seventeen. Seven zero was seven, gopher. What, what's... Seven zero was gopher. One seven was Waze. Quote of the right? day. No, quote or, of the port, day. One seven is quote of the day. So if you you hit that port, oh, it would fire, give you back yeah. a message. Wide area information search. What port was that? I don't remember. Me either. That's why I asked. Oh. 
Uh, but you know, I just want to throw that one of those obscure, you know, go for era. Protocols. There's someone out there yeah, like going for the walk, listening to the show, screaming out a port number now for everyone to hear. Yep. <laughs> Gopher. Oh, I'm sure they are. I just try. I can't freaking remember what port it was on, and I know I I, I ran the damn service. I also ran a Gopher server. Um, cool. It's, you know, Gopher. Oh, no, it's not. No, two ten. No way. Port two ten. Mm. We'll go with that. Port two ten. <laughs> Someday we'll have a quiz or game show. Yeah, nobody told uh, me there was going to be a test tonight. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other news stories you want to, or are we, I think we we're exhausted good. the news for this week? <clears throat> well, thank you guys. You thank you everyone for listening and watching this edition of Paul Security Weekly. Larry, uh, take us out. Over and out. <laughs>